everybody today. I'm Andrew Nelson. I'm the chair of the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Western Ontario. And we're here to welcome Adia Benton today for, for a much anticipated talk. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a little introduction to Ragdan Darnell, who, this, this, uh, who has sponsored this distinguished lecture. Um, and then we will have a land acknowledgement. Uh, Greg Beckett will introduce the speaker, and then we will actually get to the speaker. Um, Regnant Darnell came to the Department of Anthropology at Western in 1990, coming to us from the University of Alberta. And uh, in her time here, she's uh, uh, served as department chair. She was the founding director of the uh, uh, First Nations Studies Program, um, which has now morphed into the Indigenous Studies Program. And <clears throat> over the years, she studied uh, linguistic and cultural anthropology in, in the prairies here in southwestern Ontario, but she's also been interested in things like cultural theory, history of anthropology, uh, First Nation, Nations ecosystems health, the nomadic legacies of First Nation individuals, and finally she returned to the subject of her doctoral dissertation, Franz Boas, as the father of anthropology in North America. The Franz Boas paper project was funded in 2013 by Shirk Partnership Grant. Her research has garnered international recognition, including a number of impressive awards, including a fellowship in the Royal Society of Canada, Western's Helmuth and Distinguished University Professors Prizes, a Killam Research Fellowship, a Premier's Research Disti a Premier's Distinction Award um, in the Social Sciences and Humanities. Her inter interdisciplinary and collaborative approach to academia can be seen in her affiliations that include the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, Center for Theory and Criticism, Center for Ecosystem Health, and the Masters of Public Health program. She also has an impressive record of service to the university and to academia, including uh, her term as department chair, two terms as faculty association president and president of the Canadian Anthropology Society and a number of other similar organizations. Her dedication to teaching is well known. She supervised more than 13 doctoral students and three MA theses over the last decade alone. In addition, she's established a Regnant Darnell Graduate Award for fieldwork in sociocultural anthropology, and, she provide, and this provides critical support for student retention and recruitment. So we're here today for the Regnant Darnell Distinguished Lecture in Theory, Ethnography, and Activism in Anthropology, which Regna established in 2017. The objective of this lecture series is to bring internationally recognized anthropologists into the department. I'll let her lay out the key objectives of the lecture series in a moment, um, but uh, uh, briefly it reflects Regna's belief that anthropologists should be activists with collaborative anthropology holding the key to giving voice to people we work with and work towards decolonization. The Department of Anthropology is grateful for Regna's contributions to scholarship, teaching and service and for establishing this excellent lecture series that brings Dr. Benton to us today. So, Nicole, can you give us the um, land acknowledgement, please? Absolutely, Professor Nelson. So, we are gathered virtually on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawak, and Attawandaron peoples, connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum, for those of you beyond Western University's lands, I highly encourage you to situate yourself using the native land uh, link that I will post in the chat afterwards. We respect the long-standing traditions and relationships that the Indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge the historic and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada, such as, though certainly not limited to, the water insecurities that have presently been experienced by Chippewa, the Chems First Nations, who remain under a boil water advisory, and things such as the continuous violence against Indigenous women and girls. As anthropologists, we recognize the contributions that our field has made to the formation and perpetuation of these injustices. And as workers within a public institution, we accept responsibility to positively contribute towards reconciliation by correcting misinformation, both within and beyond the bounds of academia, as well as cultivating respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. We will strive to improve understandings across cultures and are dedicated towards working to create equitable relationships with the nations that host us on your land. 
I ask that it, you take a moment to reflect on your positionality and actions towards reconciliation. And I highly encourage you to share these contributions and ideas in our collaborative space after the lecture. And I'll pass it on to you, Professor Beckett. She will go to, uh, to Regna next to talk, introduce the, uh, the lecture series. Thank you, Andrew. The Franz Boas Distinguished Lecture Series is an outreach and dissemination initiative of a generous $2.5 million partnership from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The Franz Boas Papers Documentary Edition has funded a, a broad array of projects. Anthropology urgently needs a more flexible new paradigm that crosses and integrates intersecting diversities. I situate the history of anthropology at the intersection of theory, ethnography, and activism, and call for a fluidly evolving revisionist model that is open-ended, processual, and reflects the uncertainties of contemporary times. Transportable knowledge is about plasticity and complex causality in the absence of known outcomes or guaranteed successes. It crosses interdisciplinary, international, interpersonal and institutional dimensions of variability. It speaks to the public good. Only grassroots political pressure keeps politicians focused on sustained attention to problems of climate change, social diversity, and other ills of contemporary society. Archival research engages community-based collaboration and feedback at all stages of a given project in response to community needs. Partners include the Muscomitic Zadnadanu Tribal Council, the American Philosophical Society, whose archives are the contemporary stewards of the Boas papers, the University of Nebraska Press, who publish and market completed volumes, and three Canadian universities in four provinces. The governing body and Indigenous Advisory Council is supported by an international editorial board. The priorities are one, advise on community control, access and dissemination of intellectual property. Two, digital knowledge sharing to return materials to their originating communities. Three, capacity building among community-based cultural experts in communities and in the academy, often the same people. Let me turn to Franz Boas and why we should still care who he was and what he said. Anthropology provided the methodological lens to frame his arguments and application to any subject or crisis. A new way of looking at social ills of his day that persist into our own tumultuous times. Boas is remembered primarily as a scholar of indigenous North Americans, but he also engaged the critique of race as anti-Semitism intensified in Nazi Germany an activist alliance with the Afro-American pedagogy of empowerment and self-realization of W.E.B. Du Bois, the cultural maelstrom of the Harlem Renaissance through Sora Neale Hurston, the rich Caribbean and African traditions devalued by the American mainstream, Melville Herskovitz, and an activist agenda in Mexico, Manuel Gamil. In, to give one illustration, I parallel his long-term support of community-based linguist Elakari Deloria, Standing Rock Sioux, and Zora Neale Hurston, remembered today more as literary scholar than anthropologist, as parallel poles integrating Boas's experience of racial diversity in the interwar years. Thank you. Thank you, Regna. And Greg, if you'd like to introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Benton is Associate Professor of Anthropology and African Studies at Northwestern University. She's a cultural anthropologist and a medical anthropologist who specializes in global health and among many other things on how care is provided in humanitarian emergencies and in development projects. Her research has focused on patterns of inequality in the distribution of and the politics of care and on the political, economic, and historical factors shaping how care is provided 
in complex humanitarian emergencies and longer term development projects like those around health, for example. Her first book, HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone, which explored the framing of AIDS as a, quote, exceptional disease and how that framing takes away from other diseases and public health challenges in poor countries, won the Rachel Carson Prize from the Society of Social Studies of Science in 2017. She's currently working on The Fever Archive, a book that will explore the 2014 to 2016 West African Ebola epidemic, focusing on the militarization of public health response, US biosecurity and the global war on terror, and what she calls the racial immunologics of triage and the politics of care. Dr. Benton has published extensively in a wide variety of venues on topics including the visual analyses of humanitarian images, race and humanitarian professionals, security and military paradigms during epidemics, and the temporality, uh, uh, and temporality in an era of antiretroviral therapies for HIV AIDS. Dr. Benton is also a leading public intellectual and expert. She regularly speaks to journalists and podcasters on issues of global health, political economy, race, and gender, and is a leading figure in developing novel modes of public engagement through her widely cited and followed blog, ethnography911.org, and her Twitter account, at ethnography911. Uh, her, the title of her talk today is Inoculating History, Salvaging What is Held, Race, Epidemiology, and Immunity from Freetown to Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Banton. Hi, thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction, Greg, and thank you, Regna, for your uh, um, wonderful uh, project and endowment, uh, Andrew, for the invitation, and Laura for coordinating all of this. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, herding cats, I know. So um, today I am going to, I guess I'll just start because I, I you know, things happen. Um, we're trying to see how, how long it can be. Um, please bear with me with some, I think I might have a few technical weird, technically weird things because I will be sharing sound at some point. Um, and actually I wonder if, you can tell me if this is going to um, work because I'm now thinking that it might not with my sound. We see your desktop now. Which is weird because you technically should be seeing me. <laughs> I'm not sure why this is suddenly, uh, ah, that's why. Okay, and so you're hearing my sound? Uh, we can see the PowerPoint. Uh... And you can hear me talking can hear you talking no, no additional sound that's perfect so um i just wanted to make sure because with headphones it usually changes all kinds of things so as as mentioned the title of this is inoculating history and salvaging what is held and it's it's a kind of work in progress from the book that i'm i've been trying to finish for a couple of years um so we'll begin in, in 2017 so in August 2017, I joined a special curator tour of the Ebola People, Public Health and Political Will exhibit at the David J. Sensor Museum, which is located at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. The museum's website and the driving directions attached to the email confirming my tour reservation suggested arriving early so that I could go through security. There were two security checkpoints one near the entrance of the campus and another one located at the museum's entrance, which is pictured here. It was the second time I'd been to the exhibit in as many days, but on this visit, I arrived by foot, which seemed to cause a bit of confusion for the three security guards that were posted, um, who were likely unaccustomed to tourists who were also pedestrians. Atlanta and its unwalkability, particularly on this, in this side of town, um, though it has gotten better in the past 20 years, surprisingly. Um, it weighed on my encounter with the guards. Whoa, ma'am, whoa, a guard shouted in my direction. I hesitated, confused. I'd been walking along the edge of the road leading toward the museum when the sidewalk abruptly ended. You have to cross here. The guard signaled toward the areas marked with yellow paint, and then you can walk on the sidewalk again. Where are you trying to go? And I say, to the museum, and they point me in the direction. So the museum's entrance was another few uh, hundred feet from the guard's kiosk, but as I'd been warned in the email, and as I knew from my visit the day before, I would also have to pass through this second layer of security at the museum's entrance. So I made friendly small talk with the two uniformed guards, 
who were middle-aged black men who could easily have been my brother or my cousins or my neighbors as I signed in. I offered my passport as identification because I was heading to Sierra Leone that same day. Um, and I signed the visitor's log, waited for the guard seated at reception to give me my, my badge. Two of them traded banter as I waited. Do you always give each other such a hard time? The guard seated next to the x-ray machine and metal detector chuckled, placed my items on the conveyor belt and maybe walked through the detector. He said, you're good to go and enjoy the tour. So the other side of the checkpoint, which is here, and I think on the cir poster that circulated, I didn't put the picture in this, in this uh, PowerPoint, shows that there's the sun flooded um, atrium seating area where the handful of museum visitors wait for the tour to start. Overhead, there's a massive widescreen monitors that play day-to-day -day work of public health. In one segment, Black women socialize in beauty salons. They educate each other about physical fitness and weight loss. Um, in another, the CD, members of the CDC Special Pathogens Branch share the excitement they experience when investigating an outbreak. So as we neared the scheduled starting time, a small crowd of around 30 people began to gather near the first panel of the exhibit. We visitors were distinguished from employees by the generic pink and salmon pre-printed visitor badges clipped to our shirts. Employees chatted with each other, their photo ID badges printed on sturdier plastic material hanging around their necks. At 12.30 sharp, Louise, the museum coordinator, corralled us to the start of the exhibit and made introductions to the docents for, docent for the, the curator tour. It takes a village to make an exhibit, she told us as she introduced Pierre Rollin, who is the French physician and epidemiologist and veteran Ebola responder standing there in the white shirt and jeans. Um, guided by Louise and Pierre, we were pulled into and channeled through the organizing logics of US public health and its culture. And I'm reminded of Boaz, Boaz's uh, discussion of the role of the museum and, 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 and the organization of culture areas. Um, and I'm kind of playing with that idea. The people to which the, the exhibit title referred in people, public health and political will was the gloss for population which serves as the object of public health intervention. The elementary structures of outbreak investigations, person, place and time were also part of that organizing logic. A zoomed out view of the political economy of the region a view that was described by a trip advisor reviewer of the museum as too leftist, but was in reality just liberal. Um, and then a constrained account of US politics and individualized political agency encapsulated by the milk toast phrase, political will. So in the first few panels of the exhibit, which are pictured here, we learn about a timeline for the West African outbreak where it fit into the grand scheme of Ebola outbreaks since its discovery in 1976 and the social, ecological, economic, political factors shaping the historical levels of transmission in this region called the Mono River region, um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, which had previously not seen an extensive outbreak of the disease. So when I first started to conceptualize uh, this version of the book project, I was spurred by connections between dual crises expand, spanning the Atlantic in late 2014. That the first was the movement for black lives in the United States and the response to Ebola in West Africa. And I'd started to think about the pandemic response in relation to racial capitalism and related concepts of capture, enclosure, care and containment, which formed threads through the chapters. I should also point out that to some extent this formulation um, is kind of rooted in a, in a way in some of this Herskovitzian uh, notion of the, the sort of traces of traces of the Black Atlantic um, kind of moving through the space. Um, so when I was asked to comment on Vin Kim Wen's recent writing and thinking on the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, he introduced a not yet fully theorized idea of humanitarian capture, which I interpreted to mean that the humanitarian industry and humanitarian ideologies, the ethics of emergency, exert political influence to take control of the 
decision-making apparatus of the state. So instead of say corporate capture, we're talking humanitarian capture. Um, and specifically, I found that the modifier humanitarian was useful for thinking about how humanitarian practices are sutured to market mechanisms of extraction, exploitation, dispossession, and displacement. So what specifically about humanitarianism lends itself to these practices to have its activities organized via these logics? I argue here that a lot of it is rooted in a, in a sentiment uh, in demonstrating concern. So for me and the purposes of this lecture, the museum is a key site for examining this form of capture for the CDC, a key actor in the outbreak responds. And I should probably preface this by saying that the CDC does not see itself as a humanitarian organization by any stretch of the imagination, though it may express or, or at least try to think with or espouse certain kinds of humanitarian ideals. Um, but they're a key actor in the outbreak responds within the US and internationally. Uh, the CDC's participation in the official uh, response marks the agents, agency's largest deployment of staff ever to an outbreak, with 1,500 deployments to um, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. 80,000 person days of effort, you know, this is how you know it's a government agency, right? Um, and a level one emergency operations activation, which is essentially the 24-7 situation room thing that you imagine. It's like a room surrounded by screens with clocks for every time zone and, and, and you know, conference room tables. And at some point um, it was said to have processed something like 80% of the samples that were sent in for diagnosis. And we're talking 30,000 um, cases over a year and some change, or over about a year. So we're talking about a lot of, of um, samples being processed through the CDC. So these capture logics and practices are mirrored in the museum on multiple levels. One level concerns the context in which the diagrams that I will examine are made um, and what collecting and gathering practices make it possible for certain objects to appear centrally in the exhibit, to stand in for say, the representational practices of outbreak investigation and management. And I'll show this with a, a whiteboard but also this stunning array of forms, maps, and graphs that fill up the museum's um, walls. So this is sort of, um, these are actually items and items in the, in the uh, exhibit. A second thinks with Atlanta as a key node in the US Imperial Network, where the history of malaria, slavery, racial segregation, and late native dispossession sits in uneasy tension with black prosperity, residential segregation, and inequality. Um, the way that uh, Tony Cade Bambara mentions it, or describes it in her book, Those Bones Are Not My Child, she describes Atlanta as gone with the wind Atlanta, new international city Atlanta, Atlanta, Black Mecca of the South, second Re reconstruction city, home of a bulk of Fortune 500 companies, and so on and so forth, um, which becomes important in the second part of this lecture. The third level focuses on how CDC chooses to represent all of these facts and their interventions into them to the public as a method of, of inoculating itself from its own pathological and pathogenic histories. So how and why do all of these objects make their way into the collections of the CDC Museum? How and why do some objects fit into the story CDC wants to tell about itself? Again, I want to draw attention to the relations among these objects and how they relate more broadly to a version of global health that is very much US centric, operates through US racial, bureaucratic, administrative frames and which circulate widely in the developing world. So what might the gathering and collecting practices in one context have to tell us about those same and sim or similar practices in the other? Um, so I'm trying to look at the double lives of these objects in the field and the museum, again, interestingly spurred by reading of Boaz's theory of the museum in, uh, in the American uh, Natural History Museum, which I have visited for the, they had an Ebola exhibit 
<laughs> um, sort of tacked on to like a giddy work exhibit, another project that I'm working on. Um, and so it's helping me to think through the logics, logistics, and practices of humanitarian capture, which in the case of the US public health, bifurcates, institutes, reproduces labor and spatio-temporal hierarchies, the moral and racial coding associated with them. This is a lot of blah, 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 but basically what I'm trying to show, here are the, here are the bifurcations that I'm, I'm particularly interested in because these are the ones that came up as I talked to people who, in, who were part of this massive response, both in the CDC and outside of it. And so um, what was interesting is those were the distinctions between the field and the office or the field and the hotel. And the reason I bring this up here is because um, one of the things that sort of came up as I talked to people from various, in various parts of the response is they complained that the CDC uh, officials were sitting in the hotel room or in the hotel situation room, uh, room in the basement, just waiting for data to come to them, right? So they were never, and they only cared about the data and they weren't really invested in doing, providing technical assistance in other ways, which is fascinating because in the museum, there are these pictures of people like walking in the grass, wearing you know, their big backpacks, you know, and, and sleeping under bed nets and doing those things that people associate with field work. The other tension that is there is the clinical is between clinical medicine and public health. So caring for patients versus um, doing all this providing technical assistance, um, which is and so slaking epidemiological models thirst for data. Um, putting together all of these sort of data data sets to be able to make sense of, of the, um, the situation on the ground. And this duality's inscription into the CDC's identity from the 1970s forward under the administration of the global health superstar Bill Fagey, who uh, I will briefly talk about later. Um, and then there's this patrol work versus detective, oops, it should say detective work and not police work. So who is intellectually equipped to perform the labor of active surveillance um, versus the labor of passive surveillance and investigation? And this is a racialized distinction as are all of the others. They are space, and again, just to kind of get back to that, when I talk about the labor and the spatio-temporal hierarchies and the moral and racial coding associated with them, this is where I see those, these bifurcations manifest and playing out. So um, the circulations across these boundaries are focused on bringing the action back home and projecting a certain vision of the agency's value to the US national health and well-being and the place of black life, of blackness in this vision in the calculations of value. So this tour was scheduled to last for two hours, um, but we had spent like half of the time lingering in those first third of the exhibits 21 sections with Louise, who had offered a general overview of the exhibit, and Pierre, who chimed in with Ebola specific expertise and local color from his years uh, responding to e uh, Ebola outbreaks in Central and East Africa. So Louise was really conscious of our limited time together and glancing at her watch, she told us that we would skip ahead to two yet to be disclosed highlights of the exhibit, one that she selected and another selected by Pierre. I'm only going to focus on the uh, uh, Louise favorite because I thought it was the most interesting and visually compelling. Um, she brought us to this, which is the, um, the whiteboard, which is on the left of the screen. And it's basically a, you can see it. Some people have probably seen this before. Or some of you have maybe, maybe even went to the exhibit. Um, but this is the whiteboard that she selected um, and helped, I guess, to pick for the exhibit with the US Public Health Service Captain John Red. And this was mounted in a custom built black wall enshr enshrined in plexiglass. It had been used in the Western Area District Ebola Response Center or the Command Center, which had been located at the British Council in Freetown. A colleague of theirs had packed and delivered the item to Atlanta. Isn't it the most spectacular piece, she said, 
A few members of the tour group moved closer to the whiteboard to inspect it more carefully, so did I. Um, and I looked around and scanned everyone's faces. I couldn't tell if they agreed with Louise's assessment because everyone was sort of taking, uh, taking, trying to kind of take in. Let me see if I have another. Yeah, this one's better. Um, and so, you know, this is, I'll just sort of briefly explain what this is because it, I think it's actually important to think about what, what's actually going on here. So basically it's this, um, whiteboard, it's, it's divided into six sections. Um, and it num each, each sort of section is a generation of infection. And these all cover roughly June to July of 2015. And each generation contains uh, a red, black, or green squares. Um, and each of the squares is containing a little bit of information about each person represented by the square. <clears throat> So the index case, the leftmost square reads MK M35 O0606 R16 slash 066S. What does that mean? So <laughs> the color of the square along with the text written inside of it encodes the circumstances of, of MK's Ebola infection in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And this is actually in this neighborhood called Magazine Wharf. Um, which I used to pass through, but never spent a lot of time in, even though it was fairly close to a, one of my former field sites. So MK is a 35-year-old man who experienced symptoms of the disease on June 16th, 2015. He reported his infection to health authorities on June 16th and eventually survived. So in epidemiological parlance, he's the sole member of Generation Zero. He is the index case for the group of infections. So put another way, in this cluster of Ebola infections, MK is thought to be the primary case from whom others in his neighborhood contracted Ebola. Each of the arrows leads from, leading from MK signals a contagious relation. That is, the relationship of disease causation of closeness and contact of infection. Each of the subsequent infections from these contagious relations occurred between relatives, co-workers, neighbors, coexisting and caring for one another. Was this a spectacular piece? Many of us were struggling to make sense of what we were seeing, the spectacle at the center of her question. After all, the whiteboard diagram had not been drawn for us, the museum visitors, but for and by the epidemiologists and other field workers investigating the magazine work cluster. It was never meant to be preserved as context, contents fixed in time and space for as long as the whiteboard is stored in the CDC warehouse. It was meant to be written on, erased, the process of tracking cases begun anew. If the whiteboard, as Metalman suggests, represents an unlimited recording capacity with the loss of any permanent trace, then it had likely held information organized about earlier clusters. What is underneath? The magazine War Cluster whiteboard as a cultural object encourages reflection on its embedded politics and epistemologies, to quote Shannon Matter. Its metadata would be the data source, why it was compiled and by whom, which logics were used to process raw data that make up the chart. What we, didn't uh, um, what we didn't immediately see in the drawing were the multiple actors, the dozens or so teams that visited Magazine Wharf daily. There could be 80 to 90 people kind of descending on this neighborhood once infections had picked up. And they collected the information each little bit of information organized here. What, it, what labor does such collection entail? Um, the small bits of clinical biography it condensed into facts of contagions of relationality via kin and care networks, via virality itself. So once the whiteboard had left its anchor in Freetown, it was no longer a tool of unlimited recording capacity and ephemeral exhibition, but a museum object. And even if its contents at first seemed cryptic to us, many of us were familiar with the role that the whiteboard plays in professional fields as a way to depict and visualize description and explanation with the aim of either maintaining or reforming them. Um, so the interesting thing, I'm, I'm, so there's a point at which I found in the this, uh, digital archive of the, of the museum, an interview between the curator and, and this public health service person, John Red, who was offering his own interpretation of this whiteboard. And, and he said, it reflects people, 
each of these boxes is a human being. And what always strikes me both at the time and now as I look back, because now this is of course, this is from the summer of 2015. So it's two years ago for him. All of these people, these are all people and you can see how they're related. It brings the tragedy of Ebola into focus because even though there were thousands of cases, there were almost 4,000 deaths in Sierra Leone, for example. But each of those was an individual person. And that's what I really think when I see something like this in such detail, because ultimately controlling Ebola was about trying to save people. So where Red is reminded of the humanity of his interlocutors via their depiction as contagious subjects, I'm reminded of the humanitarianism, adherence to industry norms of expressing common humanity as a hallmark of concern and compassion of Red and his coworkers expressed through the co collection of objects from the field. The whiteboard is a standard in epidemic thrillers and police procedural dramas. In epic film, epidemic films like Contagion and Outbreak, for example, epidemiologists use the whiteboard to describe and explain patterns of disease transmission and to showcase their expertise for the viewer. I'm sure if you've seen that movie, you remember this. This is when everyone learns about R naught. You, you, did, you probably never thought you'd need to know that information, right? Um, <laughs> but here we are. So, um, and then the uh, police procedural, in the police procedural, it's a mnemonic device that allows detectives and other crime analysts to keep track of relationships among suspects, victims, and accomplices, bodies of evidence linking them to a crime. This comes up again. So here, the whiteboard diagram functions as a technology that both enables intervention and relationships, disease causation, of closeness, of contact, of infection. Each of the sub subsequent infections from these contagious relations occurred between relatives, coworkers, neighbors, coexisting and caring for each other. Um, though I just, sorry, I just, um, they refigure the boundaries between the representations of scientific facts that facilitate interventions and cultural artifacts that exhibit the intervention. As synecdoche of the operations center, it helps to orient the strategy for mobilizing boots on the ground or the shoe leather detectives such that they can reach every point of contact among kin, neighbors, and colleagues. It also represents such strategic mobilizations by helping epidemiologists to visualize contagion or patterns of relation mediated by the virus. So um, I went through this small collection of documents uh, I pulled together about Magazine War, because again, it was a place that I often passed through to, on the east end, to the east end of Freetown, but I never really um, paid a lot of attention to it, even though it was often in the news um, for a bunch of reasons. And some of the earliest scholarly writing in Magazine War was, about, uh, was in the form of tropical medicine research, focused primarily on the extent of mosquito breeding and the variety of anopheles in the area. Assess, assessing children's malarial infections via spleen measurements. If I were much more attuned to my PowerPoint presentation, I would show you the pictures of the measurement, the, the, the lady, lady doctors measuring children in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but the contemporary writing about the place is largely centered on the public health and development projects implemented through community-based organizations um, like this picture here. This is actually a military personnel who started an NGO um, for children affected by Ebola. And um, it's also talked about as being the place with a horrible water and sanitation situation. Um, you hear it especially from say the local news. And so among the oral history interviews in the CDC digital archives, several people offered some insights and I'm going to try this and see if it works. Um, I found these to be potentially useful for thinking about how this was actually playing out amongst um, the workers, um, the CDC workers, at least. Um, this is Sam Robson. Today's date is. And so I ended up getting into the case. Yeah. Sorry. The, the thing that was difficult in the outbreak was that I mean, it shut down the local healthcare system, but it also shut down health resources for our team. Right. And and one of the really big challenges was that um, febrile gastroenteritis was so common on our team. I had two or three people a day calling me with fevers and 
diarrhea and vomiting. And Sarah's prior expertise in, in diarrhea <laughs> haunted her. <laughs> yeah. I want to pause here to note that these are, I, I, because I did not introduce them, these are two of the senior officials who were working. Um, well, these are two senior officials. I did mention that they were John Red and Sarah Bennett. And there is an oral history project uh, carried out by the CDC where they talked to, I think it was maybe up to a hundred or so different people. And so these people are the ones who are actually responsible for coordinating um, different teams in, in space. So um, there's a lot to say about all of this, but I, I, um, I'll do actually, there was a, it's a longer story, but I will play this segment. <laughs> so um, as I said, the, you know, the, these teams were, and there were probably eight of them, eight teams, each of which probably had 10 to 15 people. It would vary a little bit. Um, so there were really a lot of uh, people down on Magazine Wharf who were clearly there looking for Ebola. So, you know, it was not, it was easy to tell who was, um, uh, who was an expat and who wasn't, and 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 not <laughs> just not, and not just because of skin color, but yeah, because there's a lot of responders people, that people, were not yeah. right. Uh, but people, people you know, there were loads and... of locals, but they would always have T-shirts or you know something yeah. identifying them. So and this woman had been down on on magazine, and um, it was very very hot, and then you know you tromp up and down the stairs, and it was really pretty brutal sometimes. And and she got up to buy the, and but bear in mind that. You know, they're down there asking, you know, does anyone have diarrhea, anyone vomiting? And um, she got back up and was walking by the fish market and was just sort of overcome, overcome by the smell <laughs> and vomited. And and that word word uh, went around the wharf uh, pretty quickly <laughs> that she'd been sick. It was inc incredibly quickly. I mean, they're so, you know, it's a talking culture and the people are so densely packed and, boy, stuff would... It kind of makes you wonder, actually... The, the cases that we think we missed in the wharves that kept that transmission sort of percolating along in the wharves, you know, everybody must have known that those mm -hmm. cases existed. Right. I mean, it's so, you can't hide anything in the wharves. Because we were sure that... that you can hide in, them in from that, us, but in, you can't yeah. hide it from the from the people of the wharves. That wharf, would have been yeah. happening. So there, I, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. I couldn't, I didn't want to play, you know, bore you by playing like three minutes of, of audio, especially without uh, captions or subtitles. But in the previous um, segment of this interview, which, which lasts for about two hours, in the previous segment of this interview, they kind of outline what it was like around the time that they were providing, um, they were working in. And so they all stayed at this place called the Radisson Blue Mami Yoko Hotel. And at some point, because everyone knew that the wharves nearby were percolating infection, they'd quarantined all of those spaces around the hotel. So the people in the hotel could still move in and out very freely, but these, uh, I guess, slum, slum dwellers and their quarantine were actually, even they were like butted up against the Mami Yoko Hotel, but, they, but there's free movement in and out of the hotel because of these folks, but they were also, um, you know, they, so they were doing their visits from their hotel. And the idea was that there was like this, basically this sort of what I would call uh, or think about as this quarantine that basically um, mirrored these kind of colonial town formations in terms of the segregation related to disease transmission and also the free movement of certain people versus others. So the, the wall, one, as, as one of my good uh, legal anthropologist friends who studies um, uh, extradition treaties said, he says, walls are not just barriers, they're also channels. They're, they're ways, to, they're, they're ways of, of, of tracking movement. And so um, I didn't play that segment, but it was the thing that kind of moved me before. Um, one of the other things that they do in that segment, and the reason that the, the fish market and the smell is important, is in their descriptions of, of Magazine Wharf, you saw those pictures, they focused on how it smelled, um, how treacherous it felt because of the heat. And there's a, a way that they sort of talk about this and the other and the other hotels, like what it was like to be sick and have to be forced to stay in these hotels that were actually quite horrible. Um, and also how they felt like they should be inoculated by their 
non Sierra Leoneanness, right? So they, that their their movements actually shouldn't be. And so they were often trying to protect, like, so they were really concerned about vomiting and whatever in public because they didn't want people to think that they were sick. Um, and the assumption was that they in fact were not sick uh, with Ebola. So that's something to, um, that's sort of a part of this sort of broader racial immunologic that, I, that I've been trying to talk about. So now that we're kind of out of magazine wharf, or I hope we're out of magazine wharf, um, I kind of want to go back to August 5th, uh, 2014 in Atlanta, because that's when the story of the exhibit actually began. So on the day that this missionary volunteer aide, Nancy Wrightwell, became the second American evacuated to Atlanta from Liberia to be treated for Ebola. Uh, she was accompanied by police and FBI escorts uh, from Dobbins Air Reserve Space. And Wrightwell was met by several attendants at the Emory University Hospital on Clifton Road. The ride to the hospital, while described as by authorities as uneventful, was a media spectacle that drew unwanted negative attention to the CDC, which is located on the same road, mere blocks away, for people who are not familiar with Atlanta's <laughs> sprawling geography. Um, and so this, this CDC um, at this, the, so on this street, there's a sea of media, according to Louise, with reporters and camera people roving between the CDC and the hospital. And so she decided at that moment to draft a, a, a formal request to the CDC employees who'd been deployed to the Ebola affected region to return with objects from their field work. And when I was having this, I was interviewing her on the phone at this point, and she says to me after lowering her voice, I wasn't going to let that happen again. And I remember writing, what is that? You know, but I just, I wanted to keep her talking so I didn't stop her to say, what was that? Because she eventually told me what that was. Um, and that referred to her failure to recognize the significance of the 1979 to 1981 Atlanta child murders and disappearances when they were happening. The story was this. Louise arrived in Atlanta in the 1970, late 1970s and had worked for the city's historical society. It was like her first job, you know. And she was collecting and cataloging materials of historical significance at the same time that two dozen black children from Southwest Atlanta, mostly boys, um, nine to 14, but also there were a couple of girls um, and they were turning up missing or they, they turned up dead. So black families everywhere were on high alert. In my hometown, Columbia, South Carolina, which is about a three and a half, um, with, with my dad driving, it was three and a half hour <laughs> drive from Atlanta. And we speculated about the possible killers and we feared for our lives. And as I was rewriting this part of the book, I texted my brother, Joey, who was about the same age as many of the missing and murdered children. And I asked him if he remembered anything about the murders. And he said, um, I wanna say that we went to dad to Atlanta during that time for the black social workers convention. I was scared to death. And so I said to him, did I go too? And he said, yeah, you were there because you know who would leave a, like a three or four year old at home, right? So <laughs> indeed the annual meeting for the National Association of Black Social Workers was in Atlanta in 1981. I called my father to see what he remembered uh, given the annual meeting also typically included service work in black communities where the event was held. He remembered few details, but he was able to recall two things. A fundraiser for the mothers group that had launched its own investigation of their children's disappearances and deaths and how frightened my brother had been. So these children's deaths and disappearances had clearly left its mark on communities well outside Atlanta's borders, but the terror and despair left in their wake were mostly deeply felt by Atlanta's black poor and working class neighborhoods, all of which were at the time an opposite pole of the city from CDC's main campus. So why had that her failure to document the murders of black children, been Louise's point of reference that day for her work documenting the Ebola crisis that was unfolding in West Africa. Where was I when I was not collecting those materials, she asked. And so I did wonder, and I, I asked myself, I, I didn't ask her, even though I eventually talked to her multiple times after, um, like, why, you know, why is she 
why is she concerned about this? Um, I think at the time I was afraid to stop her and, and, and ask her explicitly. Um, but also because I think it would have, I worried that it would be illiberal for her to have to acknowledge that she's talking about the sort of racial gendered class underpinnings of her failure to conceive of these crimes as historically significant at the time. So if we start from those kind of feelings about the silences in the archive about Black suffering in Atlanta. It is possible to discern how US po racial politics along with global racial hierarchies suffuse CDC institutional memory and memorial practices. In this case, it served as a motivation to begin rapid response collection of materials from West Africa, a kind of salvage, um, a salvaging um, response, I think. So put bluntly, the same racialized gender and class inequalities that made it a story of historical insignificance have also supported this archival humanitarian impulse to demonstrate concern through collecting objects that testify to and signify victims and heroes, struggles, tragedies, and triumphs. But of course, this was only part of the story, right? You know, it was never just about like her own feelings of shame and guilt, I realized at some point that I had not actually been down to the permanent exhibit in like 20 years. So I went and I went in 2018 and I took a self uh, guided tour after meeting with Louise. And that's when I realized that she was just, she wasn't just like riffing, right? Um, it, her, it was more than her reflection on what Trio um, first talk called about the first moment of historical production, the silence inherent in the creation of sources. So we're in the middle of, somewhere in the middle of this permanent exhibit downstairs is a section called a public health approach to violence. So this is what the bottom looks like. And this panel chronicles the role of the CDC in establishing violence as a public health problem with explicit reference to a period that a health, uh, a handful of CDC epidemiologists assisted the Atlanta Police Department with their murder investigation. Um, so let's take a step back for a second. The CDC, I mentioned, said I would mention Bill Fagey, and this is when I'm going to do it. He was the CDC director at the time, um, much heralded physician epidemiologist. He was a smallpox eradication campaign veteran. They call them the order of the bifurcated needle. I kid you not. Um, he was a global health champion, and he was quite keen to build up a public health involvement in violence and, inju and um, injury. And this is documented in the CDC archives. In part, this was rooted in his sense that the field of public health paid insufficient attention to the social causes of death, debility, and illness, but also in his duty as a director to carve out CDC's niche, niche uh, in a crowded health field within the US government. So there's also the National Institutes of Health and they were kind of vying for, jockeying for a position. Um, so he and his colleagues wanted CDC's niche to be prevention but Congress kept rejecting the agency's proposal to include violence and injury prevention in its mandate, despite the fact that the agency's epidemiologists had been at the forefront of gathering and analyzing um, fairly comprehensive data about the character of violence or intimate violence. Um, and so that's actually what's in the, the sort of timeline that you see there in 1973 being the, the moment at which they started doing this data collection work. Um, I happened to interview some of the epidemic intelligence officers who worked on this case, I, you know, it, which was kind of cool, but also interesting, right? Um, one of them actually works with biological anthropologists on gut biomes, who knew? Um, so uh, the first was Marty Blazer, who um, recalled that he returned, had recently returned from investigating an outbreak of uh, GI illness out west, gastrointestinal illness out west. And was hosting uh, like a, I think he was actually having a bris at his house. And he read in the newspaper that the Atlanta Police Department had enlisted the assistance of clairvoyants and psychics to find leads. And he said, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm sure an uh, epidemiologist could do at least as well as a psychic. And I thought we should do an epidemiological examination of what's going on here. And that night, actually, I had difficulty falling asleep, he said, which was unusual for me because I was thinking about it. It was really a kind of shift in direction for me. But the next day I went to my boss 
who had already done some work on gun violence, and he thought this was a good idea. He took it up the ranks to the CDC hierarchy to find out, could we do this investigation? Would it be permissible? And could we work with the Atlanta Police Department? And eventually it went up to Bill Fagey. As is common for all outbreak investigations, CDC needed to be invited by its local counterpart to become involved. They enlisted the support of the Fulton County Health Department and received their invitation. National News provided substantial coverage of the controversial decision to bring the CDC scientists into the investigation team. In one interview, Public Safety Commissioner Lee Brown expressed his ambivalence towards CDC's involvement um, in, because he did not see how methods of epidemiologists would differ from his own methods. Um, he says, you know, I suspect they are not much different than the techniques we use. Uh, they too gathered detailed information about victims and sought patterns that could explain their fate. Recollections about the nature of the relationship between the police and the CDC were in conflict. While Marty told me that he remembered a fairly cordial working relation, Janine Jason, a pediatric HIV epidemiologist, had a different perspective. The police, she said, were not in pleased with our involvement. They wouldn't give us the access we needed. They suspected the parents in a few of the cases, but wouldn't tell them which ones, which meant that their data set was not clean. Comparing police and detective work, she told me, no one really goes out for an investigation without, getting, without a shot at getting an answer. You design studies to not miss the thing you hope is the answer. Police are the same, but less organized. And anyone who tells you, you're, you they're entering the field objectively, they're lying. I took this as, a, as, as, as like a hint and a warning also for anthropological field research. Um, and I asked each of the EIS officers about their use of the case control study. Um, and I'm doing this because I want to um, actually, uh, if you can see on the sort of bottom left hand side, there's actually a photocopy of this article that they wrote in JAMA in the J uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, because I, I find it, I found it fascinating in a bunch of different ways. And I'm trying to see if I can find it. Uh, this is what it is. So you can actually see this a little bit more clearly. Um, this is a case control study. I'm not sure if they actually show that in there. Um, but I asked them about this because this is, I, actually maybe I should, I don't know if I should ask, everyone knows what a case control study is. You basically, um, you basically set up a study where you find people who have the disease and then people who don't, and you match them according to whether they, what you match them according to um, different characteristics to see if there's some difference, right? So if you're trying to, um, that's why it's important to know that some of these people were in, used to investigating foodborne outbreaks, which makes a lot of sense when you're at the church picnic, right? Um, if everybody gets safe from the potato salad, it's really easy to make a list and, and talk to everybody and go, oh, did you have diarrhea? Oh, did you eat the potato salad? You know, like, and then we can figure out that that's what it was, right? Um, I think it's different for crime and I think it's different for murder, but we're gonna talk about that. So um, I asked the EIS officers, um, about their use of the case control study. Mind you, this is 40 years later, but a lot of them had kept their papers. And so um, some of them were actually really surprised about the, about the, the study, if that makes sense. Like, why did I ask these stupid questions? <laughs> it's actually something that, that one of them said. But they said, our goal was to try to understand, to begin, or Marty said, our goal was to try to understand, uh, to, to understand, to begin to analyze the cases, to look for common factors. That was the first part of the investigation to see uh, if you know what epidemi and he says, you know what epidemiologists do, they investigate person, place, and time. And you know, what's the time course? What's the epidemic curve? What are the localities? Um, and uh, what are the personal characteristics that distinguish one person from the person who's afflicted um, with the disease? In this case, being murdered versus somebody who was not afflicted with the disease. Joe McCormick, who investigated the loss of fever outbreaks in Sierra Leone in 1976 and the first outbreak of Ebola in Sudan and Zaire ever, wrote hint, was more explicit in his recent memoir. He says, an outbreak investigation is very much like the investigation of a crime. It consists of detective work, following hunches, and carefully collecting evidence. In epidemiology, however, the criminal is the bug. 
find the bug and then find out how it got to its human hosts. The bug's motive, making a lot more bugs, I guess. But that's to, it's not just the bugs you're dealing with. You have to deal with people, especially the victims. It requires some effort to explain to them what you're doing and then convince them to cooperate. He describes his primary tool, the case control study. It's a scientific method that we use to discover the most important differences between the people who did become sick and those who did not, if you can determine those uh, differences, particularly when it comes to foodborne outbreaks you are usually close to pinpointing the case or the root of infection. So it cannot be overstated that public health uh, was not under, well understood, nor were CDC's motivations above reproach at this point in time, particularly where Black communities were concerned. The comedian and political activist Dick Gregory, like many Black activists, publicly questioned the decision to enlist the CDC's help, given their limited expertise in forensics or pathology. There were also rumors that the CDC themselves had kidnapped and killed the boys for experiments. Some might recall that the US Public Health Service of which CDC is a part had at that time been publicly criticized for its role in the Tuskegee syphilis study, but it is unlikely that Tuskegee in the way that it is deployed today needed to be invoked. There were other medical and scientific encounters that met, made black people very wary of the CDC and its motivations. So, um, I just wanted to like go back actually to this um, text that's right here because I think I'd like to reflect upon it with you if possible, but it, there's a point, it, it actually says here um, from 1971, 1979 to 81, Atlanta was gripped by a series of unsolved murders um, and a number of missing children cases known locally and nationally as the missing and murdered children. This is actually when um, Louise realized that she didn't have any information. She went to the historical society and said, oh my goodness, what? why didn't I collect this? This should be in the archives. I should just be able to go there and pull information. Um, and so it says most of the victims were boys between ages of seven and 14, all were African-American. And I always keep pushing up against or butting up against as concerned as other Atlantans. Um, which I think was actually one of the problems that sort of started all of this. One of the reasons it became national news is because the mothers had actually organized quite compellingly and, and very well to get more, um, more eyes on this. On this. Um, that was actually, it's, it's the result of organizing that made this uh, a something that people actually wanted to take on. So as concerned as other Atlantans, CDC scientists offered to investigate these incidences sick, of violence by using classic techniques of epidemiological detective work, not an attempt to identify the, kill, the killer or killers. The study set out to determine common risk factors among the victims. The goals were to predict which of Atlanta's other children might be likely targets and to recommend preventive measurements, measures in high-risk communities. As you can imagine, this is a very, um, you know, it, it's something to read. It's, a, it's, it's something to, to, to read this, you know, 40 years later and to think with, um, as I think they just reopened the case a couple of years ago. So they had actually convicted a guy of, of committing two of the, the adult murders that were part, seen as part of this cluster. Um, but as you can imagine, the, the, the methods used to um, talk about this, the methods used to investigate this by public health, I think show kind of has baked into it these really bizarre ideas about what can be known. The, the, and I, I also think it, it shaped the fact that it shaped the possibility of their participation, if that makes sense. So um, as it says here, it says this work was one of the catalysts that led to the establishment of CDC's violence epidemiology branch in 1983. Along with other violent studies, it demonstrated that the tools of public health can be applied to violence and its prevention. In 1992, the National Century for Injury Pre Center for Injury Prevention and Control was formed with the mission to prevent injuries and violence and reduce their consequences. In other words, the deaths and disappearances of black children and by extension, the vilification of black parents, um, which is actually, I didn't talk about in this, um, I'm not sure why I didn't. <laughs> if black parents um, 
for, form the institutional basis for agencies extension into fields of violence and injury and these issues into key public health problems. One of the things I didn't point out is after reading this paper multiple, multiple times and talking about it with the epidemiologist, one of the things that happens is you see all of those names at the top of the paper. Those are people in the police department, the, the EIS officers acknowledged are all of the people who did the data collection. So who do you think interviewed children's parents in 1981? Black nurses who worked for the public health department. Why did they do it? Because, well, I think a lot of people wanted to help, but they did it because there was a real sense that if these white epidemiologists who are sitting here in the picture showed up at people's houses, there would be a problem. And even in the stories that Marty told me, he, he, he insisted that they did a, a drive through in a white van of this neighborhood and, and that they got out and everyone stopped and looked at them. And I'm not sure if he's remembering that correctly, but it actually is a trope in all of the documentaries and films that I actually watched about the, the case. So it made me wonder if they did that at all. Others did not remember doing a drive-through, but again, it was 40 years ago. Um, and they were asking these parents, um, one of the things that I usually show is there's a, a chart that actually shows things like which elements, the, the, um, which things that the, these uh, epidemiologists put into the survey. And almost all of them were about things like whether the child is out of the house at a certain hour, um, whether there are men involved living in the house who are, who are unmarried, um, whether they're, what, the, so, they didn't ask the questions about the appearance or the smell or whatever about the house, but they actually did take note. And that's written up in the, in the, in the methodology, which is that they were supposed, the nurses were supposed to make an assessment about a socioeconomic class by looking at the condition of the children's clothes, the way it smelled and looked in the house and things like that which interestingly is, is a lot like social work. You know, I talked to my, my father about that before he passed. Um, and so there's like a, the way that that sort of gets, all of the, the sort of weird racial politics of Atlanta kind of get played into this same, in, into this logic. Um, so I've been trying to kind of pull it all together where I've been talk, thinking about the martial politics um, and epidemiological reason in, in kind of built into, uh, or the martial politics built into epidemiologic reasoning. So whereas martial politics point specifically to racialization as a function of liberal notions of war, peace, and social order, epidemiological reason both acknowledges race as an independent variable describing a person or a population as it often overlooks or evades institutional and structural dimensions of race and racism. In other words, it becomes the means by which the search for a single killer or organized group of killers might miss the point that the bug in this case might be the disposability of black youth, the willingness of managerial elites to sacrifice these youth at the altar of global capital. Um, and I think kind of global knowledge production because every single one of these investigations doesn't really necessarily, um, uh, doesn't necessarily produce publications. I'll just put it that way, but it's certainly a part of this, um, the transaction of becoming an EIS officer. So in this lecture, I've been trying to think with these two objects in the CDC museum, or maybe it's more than two objects, and with Lu Louise's provocation, which linked a failure to collect and secure the stories of Atlanta's murdered children with archival and curatorial impulse to capture and enclose humanitarian objects related to CDC's involvement in the West African Ebola outbreak. An institutional um, narrative about the role of the agency in outbreak response is built upon the symbolic density of each of these objects as tools of connection, evidence, control, surveillance, marketing, and care. The substance of the institutional narrative rests in the bowels of this peripheral semi-public space on the campus's headquarters relating a broader story about the agency's brand, its primary exports of epidemic intelligence, field epidemiology, and expanding notions of what constitutes a public health hazard. And for a brief period, another narrative straddled the museum's two levels, which is that um, Black people on both sides of the Atlantic were subjected to mechanisms of policing propped up as a form of pastoral care. And so I'll end there, um, and hopefully we'll have some kind of discussion um, about this. Thank you so much for 
uh, listening. That was great. Thank you very much for that. So, Andrew, are you want to take out take over on the uh, Q and A? Have I turned it on? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Adia. That was amazing. That was really, really great. So we've got. The, let me open the chat here, and we and you can put up your hands if you like, or uh, uh, post questions in the chat, and I can read them out. Um, uh, I, I was. I, if, can, I'll just jump in and give everyone a time some time to think. This was. This was so. Uh, Interesting and uh, something you mentioned early on and came back to a little later is um, I wrote it down here somewhere the 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 importance of demonstrating concern that is at the that is at the heart of of it seems so much of what the CDC does and um, uh, it's uh, it's a, a question I had I guess about the, about maybe the two cases like about this you know, there, there's this, this, this impetus for demonstrating concern, this desire to demonstrate concern, and then there's the capacity to actually do it. And I'm wondering if you have any sense, even over the time period between the two cases you're looking at, whether the, 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 what enables that action to take place had changed. Did, were, the, is, is, are there things about the CDC itself that have changed that have made it more possible for its representatives to act in ways that demonstrate concern. Does that, I don't know if that even makes sense. Um, I I mean, yeah, it makes it makes sense. I guess I mean, so it's it's about well, no, because it's about mobile. What do you what can you mobilize? Like, what does concern mobilize? Right? Like, what kinds of resources can concern mobilize? And yeah. I think what's interesting about it is concern is actually never. Um, it's never valued, <laughs> or, or maybe I should say it's under, it's actually undervalued and underestimated in terms of making those kinds of decisions. Yeah. So, and, and I'll, I'll use an ex, as an example, Obama's speeches about this in say August. Um, I, I went back and listened to all the speeches because I was sort of obsessed with Donald Trump's daily press conferences. And I was like, is this normal? Um, and so I went back to the Obama ones uh, that I hadn't listened to. And one of the things he always emphasized his messaging was, it's a good thing to do this Ebola, anti-Ebola work. It is humanitarian, it is humane, but it is not just humane. We need to stop this thing at its source. If we don't get it controlled over there, it's gonna be here. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's why the arrival of Nancy Wrightbull and before her, um, uh, Ken Brantley, Kent Brantley, these two Liberia, uh, American missionaries who were in, in Liberia. Um, that's why people freaked out. They were like, why are you bringing them here? Treat them somewhere else. <laughs> like, what is, and that's also why they had the sort of theater of bringing the cops and the, like, the police and the military all like in a convoy with this person's ambulance or whatever. So um, concern is the, I think concern is the thing that motivates um, motivates a lot of actors, particularly in the public health space, but it's not sufficient to mobilize the resources to do so. And it often has to be accompanied by um, other kinds of benefits and, 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 and often it is various forms of profit <laughs> and various forms of sort of securitized protectionism. Um, and those may or may not be the same thing. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at these like insurance agreements. Um, so which, com which contractors are actually used? Um, it turns out that um, in the British case, the contractors for Ebola are the same contractors for, um, you know, the war on terror. Um, and, and, and my sense is that that's probably the same for the CDC because how do you, you know, equip, how do you equip or, how do you negotiate multiple airplanes that are equipped to handle level four viruses that will also be cleared to fly over certain kind of airspace? Like, I don't know if you know this, but apparently you cannot fly over EU airspace with a person with Ebola, <laughs> like, unless you have some kind of special plan. And it makes no sense. It's like, I was like, what? Like, how? Do not that you have to fly over. Europe to do this, but it's sort of like, 
there are all these random, or not random, very like rigid regulations about what can be done with the yeah. body that is infected with this thing. Um, and, a, and a lot of it's about just keeping it, <laughs> keeping it where it belongs amongst Africans in Equatorial Africa huh. who, and their like systems, which is another reason I kind of, I wanted to play that longer clip of them talking about like, oh, what happens when we get sick? When we get sick, we just have, you know, like we, we, we're like, we can't go to the embassy because the embassy doesn't want us. So a lot of us who are MDs just sort of took on that role of just sort of being like, you don't have Ebola, you just have like Campylobacter or whatever. Take, you know, take, take some uh, antibiotics and stay in your room until you're better. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I think that, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it makes me then think of the, yeah, the, the, the difference between those, those CDC folks, I guess, in, in 1981, who, you know, were as concerned as everyone else, and which is, yeah, that's an amazing little clause to have at the beginning of that sentence, but clearly they're not like other Atlantans, there is a, they're, 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 they're quite dis, uh, uh, um, distinct, but also, uh, th that the contrast between the case where they are they are at least you know communicating this idea that they are of this or somehow associated with this same place where the people in in Sierra Leone are clearly not they're they're coming from afar I I, I find it all so interesting yeah well they were totally and they were stumbling I kind of you know I remember being like ooh like how do they well I'm, you know they're just giggling about their having to recognize yeah. that there's a distinction between the various people who um, are in this space. And one of the things I, I kind of wanted to get at, but I'm not sure I was explicit about, was in addition to CDC sort of being seen as these hotel data zombies, right? Um, there, there's also this sense that they're, you know, they're the time frames that they're allowed to be in on site are, are very much mandated by these government contracts as well, and liability and burnout and stuff like that. So when you hear them talking about their assignments, they're very clear about like, oh, you know, I was there from May X to June, blah. And they kind of talk to each other in those like two week, um, these two week segments. Um, I met a surgeon who actually had been an EIS officer during this outbreak and he was in Liberia and we were at dinner together and he goes, oh, I was there for so long, like a really long time. And I, I was like, why is he doing this? Is it because I'm an anthropologist? <laughs> like, he, he's like, I was there for a really, really long time. Like I was in that really bad place that you talk about like for a long time. And so I just sort of, I didn't say anything. He goes, I was there for four weeks. <laughs> and I went, oh, you know, I just sort of went oh, like, if I stayed anywhere for four weeks and said it was a long time, anybody, like I would, I would just be laughed off my um, whatever. Um, but that's a Malinowskian approach, you know. <laughs> but but it was definitely a yeah. Anyway, that I, that's what I was also talking about with these sort of spatiotemporal yeah um, kind of hierarchies in terms of how who gets to be where and for how long and under what yeah. circumstances, which absolutely shapes uh, exposure, um, knowledge, like how knowledge moves. So. Yeah. Thanks. Any uh, any questions, hands? Something will come up, I'm sure. I was just going to comment on your your description of the the woman walking past the fish market and dying. <laughs> it's, I've been past a lot of fish markets like that. <laughs> They smell bad, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, but you know, this is a—it's a fishing town. Like the, this is one of Freetown is, I think, one of the deepest. Um, it's a you know, it's a it's a port. It's a big port too. It's one of the, the um, big deep water ports in the world. Like one, I think something like one of the top deep water something. There's like a whole thing about it. Um, I. Actually, um, my spouse's grandfather, I, I spent time with him. He used to run, he used to actually run a, a like a pineapple grove in, in Cameroon in the 30s. And he and I and he said, Oh, I've been to Freetown. And I was like, oh, you know, I mean he he's he's since passed away, but you can imagine if he was doing this in the 30s, he's like, I was in Freetown. 
And I said, really? He said, yeah, like we would go and drop off pine, pick up pineapples and bananas on our way to Europe. And I, you know, I never, I don't know, it's sort of, I remember asking like, so what was it like? He said, well, there were a lot of like Lebanese traders and it was like this and it was like that. And I was like, huh, it's interesting what hasn't changed actually um, in terms of the global circulations of like things through these West African ports, but um, Uh, so we have uh, in the in the uh, in the comments. I can read it so that everyone can hear it. Uh, from uh, uh, Ryan Veith. So uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Just a comment, but I'm really thinking about the slippage between detective work and police work, alongside the logistics of humanitarian capture and the whiteboard. A lot to think about. Yes. Um... I, was it, I'm wondering, was it my, was it my, oh no, it wasn't my, because I did have one of those things where the slide was wrong, um, but yeah, so one of the things I've been playing with a lot is, and again, this is, this is probably an artifact of my, like, binge watching police procedurals and British ones in particular <laughs> over, you know, like, the past three years, I've been like, uh, what's next, when can I watch, like, when is, when is Vera coming back or whatever? <laughs> Box. <laughs> Shetland. Uh, so I kind of am always like super excited about Queens of Mystery. Um, but I've been sort of intrigued by the notion of the field as sort of the ground upon which all of this is happening, mm -hmm. but also what that means for the production knowledge, what it means for um, kind of the social worlds that with it, that you carve the field out of. And so the detective, the, the disease detective, which is the colloquial um, way that the epidemic intelligence service officer, like what it called, what they call themselves as part of their PR, which I know it's like, what's worse, epidemic intelligence or disease, disease detective is cute, right? And it's like, they put it in the museum. But I think one of the things that is obscured by simply referring to them as disease detectives, it sounds super fun, kind of cool, Sherlock Holmesy. Um, but the 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 gist I felt was actually they're not sort of they're not non-state actors or non-governmental actors. They're actually government agents who, or people who act with, I think, some power of the U.S. state um, to to push into communities and ask people questions about their like personal everyday existence. And I do this in the, I talk a little bit more about this in the chapter when there's a mo there are moments where these EIS officers or some of the junior epidemiologists are kind of, are, try are grappling with the fact that they're entering a place like Magazine Wharf and knocking on people's doors and being like, is so-and-so here, he's a contact of such and such. And they, they're like, oh, he, you know, they're like, no, he's not here. Of course, the person's like hiding in the corner or pretending to not be that person. Um, and there's a moment actually when in that recording where the woman, uh, Sarah Bennett is like, I started vomiting because I got whatever. And I jumped out of the car and vomited. And my driver was like, we got to go. Um, you can, I will buy a plastic bag and you can vomit in that because I don't want anybody to see you vomiting because they're going to take you away mm -hmm. and we won't see you again. They, I mean, I was like, no one, <laughs> like, first of all, no one's going to take the white woman away, yeah. but, but, but it was certainly like a, he was sort of, there's at least during those, those months, those August, September, October, 2014, Folks were going to the to get treatment, not coming back. Um, sometimes people didn't know where they were going. Um, if some people would lie and say, "Oh, that person had," you know, I saw that person with a fever, and then they just, you know, all kinds of things happened around these um, like visible signs of sickness mm -hmm. and the police, the policing. You know, I know plenty of people who were like, "I was in the holding center. I was not sick with Ebola. I yeah. got sick with Ebola there." or I escaped because I didn't know what they were gonna do. And the police would bring them back <laughs> and put them back in holding. So this was, you know, this, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there's not, 
a really fun, a good, there's no um, real distinction sometimes between police work and disease detective yeah. work. Um, and, and that's a problem. Certainly not, I'm sure, from the perspective of the people who are just facing these people, asking them questions. Who knows right. who these people are? I mean, yeah, they're like, oh, we'll never know. But the people in the wars know. And I'm like, yeah, yeah there's a reason for that. That's yeah, sure. like snitches get stitches. <laughs> so we have a question all the way from Oslo. Ming Wan. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm sorry, I have to leave in five minutes. So basically right after this question, um, I'm really intrigued by the concept of humanitarian capture. And could you pl uh, please explain a little bit more on that? Because right, so, you know, it was, it was Vin Kim who, who said it and, I, and he was talking and I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I was just sort of like, oh, that's so cool. And I was like, did you write about this? He goes, no, I just made this up for this talk. Um, and I, you know, and I was just like, okay, cool, let's talk about that. But he was basing it on corporate, corporate capture, and not like so. Some people will use humanitarian capture to talk about like what's going on in the Mediterranean to be like, you know, the European ships are catching people and bringing them into into shore to make sure they're safe. Um, someone might have even called. Um, what happened during the transatlantic slave trade when the British were capturing ships um, to, to uh, I guess, to, to um, enforce the abolition of slavery um, under, under British uh, rule. Um, to, they might've called that humanitarian capture, but in this case, we're talk, I'm talking about, and I think Ben Kim was talking about a version of corporate capture in which humanitarian industry sort of um, takes control of certain kinds of um, government state sort of state make state decision making um, stuff so legal and regulatory regimes um, I mean one thing that I would say is is like a lot like I was talking about this EU EU space um, airspace thing like so many of these decisions about how do you evacuate people whether you evacuate like which nationalities you can evacuate all that stuff is like these are these are <laughs> racial immunologics but they're also they're ones in which they're legal frameworks that are and insurance frameworks that are established between um, humanitarian entities and the state um, often what happened and I think in this case with uh, Nancy Wrightbull the this the US should have probably helped to pay for her to come back, but actually it was Samaritan's purse that paid. Um, the NGO, so the NGO took the cert take responsibility. There's also um, humanitarian goods, like basically how they circulate, they're they're regulated by um, there, or maybe I should say some of the private contractor. Uh, and corporate whatever that are part of humanitarian enterprise kind of get also get to help make decisions about the distribution and the logistics of um, the logistics of humanitarian action. So all of this to say um, different kinds of organizations were trying to um, make something out of this humanitarian crisis that includes companies that had been holding on to patents on potential drugs for Ebola, holding on to the pat I mean, this is really relevant for the Canadians because that's where ZMAP came from. Um, Canadian public money held on, they held on to the, the drug and then sold it off to like Merck or whatever. <laughs> and they were able to develop it further. Um, most of these drugs and these therapeutics and diagnostics were created in the 90s um, in the bio anti-bioterror boom. But because these were diseases affecting very poor people living in a very poor place, there was very little motivation to, do, to develop these drugs these uh, or to, to come up with these rapid diagnostics or to do all of, or to be able to scale up um, mobile clinics or, or PPE or any of those things, um, they, they kind of get shunted away until they, they are potentially uh, uh, profitable. And so, that, I mean, I guess that that's probably a long-winded way of saying what what, I, what humanitarian capture is about. Sort of the like, okay, we we're now ready to do the work. Like, yay, emergency! Um, 
the state's not able to do it. And that was particularly the case um, for Sierra Leone and Liberia, maybe a little less for Guinea, um, given that they had more doctors, nurses, and resources um, blame African socialism in the 80s, I guess. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I think we've got we've got time for because we're we're meant to be done soon to let, let you go. Uh, but Bree, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, so really quick, I'm just interested to know your point of view on how do you think anthropology could impact um, the field of public health in the future? Like, how do you think an anthropological viewpoint could really help and aid in the field of public health? That that is that's a really big question because you know I, I think one of the, the issues and I've written about this um, is the assumption that anthropology isn't there because <laughs> it is um, and in fact in this case anthropology was one of the I'd say one of the first discipline sort of disciplinary silos that um, or you know what am I saying um, one disciplinary sort of ex set one kind of expertise that was consulted. And I would argue that it's because of the nature of the thing, right? Which is, it's in Africa. This disease is like, is quintessentially African. Um, all of these, you know, there are all these reasons and it made it very easy to kind of insert anthropological, anthropologists and therefore anthropological expertise um, into the intervention. And in fact, when I first, I'd say maybe July, June of, of 2014, a friend of mine who'd worked for a bunch of NGOs sent me um, a PowerPoint presentation from MSF that they used to, in, um, to uh, I guess, induct their new people. And it, there is a cultural anthropology, medical anthropology set of slides in there. Um, I had to be like, whoa, actually, <laughs> here's a problem. <laughs> you, you don't, I mean, it was something about behavior and like cultural belief, the, the kind of stuff that I think was not appropriate for this kind of thing, which is to say that non-compliance was chalked up to um, cultural difference rather than, um, I guess, political and economic um, conditions shaping access to information and access to actual things that would help one protect themselves and others. Um, because, and, and I, I only base that upon the fact that I was living in a place where there are a lot of Liberian diasporans and they were talking to their families every week and being like, well, I had to explain X, Y, and Z about transmission. And so now my people are asking for plastic suits, boots, and chlorine. Once they were able to get that, they were able to kind of make decisions about how to care for people at home. But that was not, um, and that was true in Freetown as well. So um, I, I, this is a roundabout way of my saying, I think it depends on the version of anthropology. So anthropology is actually very um, easily Co easily co-opted and I think easily brought into the fold um, because of when based upon the kind of crisis that we were experiencing and seeing. Um, I think understanding that every public health response or, or every uh, response to a public health emergency requires a multidisciplinary, multi-expertise um, sort of thing and not just that it can't just be focused on the communities as barriers to progress it has to understand that the intervention itself is also implicated in whatever is going on and that was actually my big biggest complaint it, you know anthropologists were sitting at the table but they were very much constrained to focusing on as their object of intervention and analysis um, the community and the culture versus oh like what does it mean to have a six week um, contract versus a two week one? Or what does it mean when you put everybody in the Radisson blue? And like, what does it look like when so-and-so enters the household like this? Like what would happen? And I think I actually said this in a meeting full of anthropologists where we were on the phone with people in West Africa and they were like, well, don't you know, this is an emergency. We can't look at ourselves, that's crazy. And I'm like, 
40 years of saying that. Like, it's not like the, I'm not the first person to say that. Like everybody who works in humanitarian stuff, development stuff, they're like, yeah, maybe we should look at ourselves. <laughs> like, I mean, people were complaining about their field work and, and the conditions under which they were having to labor, the contractual, the um, infrastructural, the legal, the clinical stuff actually needed to be fixed too systematically. When we enter, we are not entering in a hermetically sealed whatever. We become a part of the community somehow. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, <laughs> but I kind of like, I, 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 you know, I hate to be the one being like, well, we, we know stuff and they don't know that we know stuff, but I think they do. It's just stuff that they want us to be able to do is really circumscribed by this idea that we're somehow cultural, cultural key masters. Um, <laughs> And, and cultural gate, somebody who can unlock every cultural gate and, and offer an explanation for why things just aren't working the way everybody wants them to or plan to. Yeah, thank you. You did answer my question. The only reason I ask is that I'm actually like just about to graduate from my undergrad in anthropology and I'm going into my master's in public health. Yes. So oh, just thought it would be a good question to ask. Good luck with that. That is a really thank hard you. transition, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I've gotten that. <laughs> I, I, I did that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, actually what I would say is take really good notes about the knowledge practices that they're trying to discipline you with. You will write a fabulous book if you, <laughs> if you just pay attention. You're like, this is how they, um, I always say that chat, there's a chapter in Byron Good's Medi Medicine, Rationality and Experience about how medicine sees its objects that actually I think public health could use a, a similar treatment because it's, it's actually quite different, but it's also formulaic in the same way because much of most of public health uh, curricula were, I guess, created and sort of spurred on by medical doctors who had, who were kind of put in the position of having to manage public health departments and in, in outbreak investigations. All right. I'm being mindful of the time. Okay. Now. So uh, yes. So uh, 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 thank you so much, Dr. Benton. Is am I am I closing this out, or are you, Andrew? I I, I think I'm supposed to. But okay, I will leave it to you then. <laughs> it was, thank you. For me personally, thank you so much. That was really great. But yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Benton. I think clapping from everybody, thunderous applause through through the ether. Um, and uh, interesting questions, very, very, very thoughtful, sort of, you know, the world needs more anthropology. <laughs> so thank you.